Okay, so I think, uh, Santosh, I'm going to go ahead and open. We still have some folks uh, signing in, but um, I'm sure by by the time I turn it over to you, we'll we'll have most of the folks and we've got about 30, uh, 30 people signing in to date. So and, um, I'd just like to uh, welcome you all as you are uh, signing in to this uh, coming of the subjective age part four which is on communication and dissemination of knowledge in the subjective age. And of course, most fitting to address this topic is our guest speaker, Santosh. So we'd like to uh, welcome you, Santosh. It's the first time that uh, he is speaking on new perspectives and we know his, his expertise and uh, his own experience in this area. So this is the, the reason we felt he was most fitting. Um, Santosh today during the topic will take perhaps a brief overview of the past versus the current age, the objective versus subjective, but his focus will be really on the differences in media between these two ages. And he'll also take a look at the related benefits, the risks, limitations, and concerns. Santosh will suggest how best for all of us to optimize the interaction with media as we transition into the subjective age and get uh, more situated into that particular age. Most of you probably know Santosh. Um, he has been studying Sri Aurobindo's writing since 1971. He is editor-in-chief at Lotus Press and is author of 16 books. Santosh is also president of Institute for Holistic Education, a nonprofit focused on integrating spirituality into daily life. So in 2019, uh, Santosh moved to Honolulu, Hawaii, where he is joining us live now at about five in the morning. And there he focuses on a daily blog, systematically reviewing the major writings of Shurabindo. And he has a worldwide following on his blog. For the last several years, he has been focused on the development of Auroville and its various units, and has been a supporter of the Flourish project spearheaded by AVI USA, which focuses on the development and outreach of the projects of Auroville. So again, we welcome you all. And as always, there will be time towards the end to uh, ask questions of Santosh, which you can either do in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, or if you want to uh, join us live, which is always very nice, and ask uh, Santosh questions face to face, just raise your hand, and we'll bring you over at that time. Um, so, with that, Santosh, um, please, I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, and welcome to everybody, uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening where you are. Um, an important aspect of what's happening with the transition of media is the fact that people all over the world with a common interest and affinity can join together in programs such as this. Uh, this is something that's absolutely new and it's part of the transition from the objective to the subjective age. So welcome everybody. You are participants in the coming of the subjective age uh, today and in whatever other ways you're participating uh, from day to day. Uh, Sri Aurobindo, in his book, The Human Cycle, discusses the various cycles and ages of humanity, the development of consciousness, and the phases through which the consciousness develops across the planet. Uh, Teilhard de Chardin talks about the development of a noosphere, a, um, a mental environment, if you will, that permeates the planet. And the objective age was focused on the idea that uh, all of humanity needed to be brought into this mental atmosphere and made citizens of the planet. And so the objective media was mass-based, uniform, and meant to disseminate a similar body of knowledge across large segments of people. And this was broken down mostly by country. Uh, the coming of the subjective age 
uh, moves us towards uh, the next phase where with that as a basis and platform, uh, individuals can begin to interact in more free and loose ways with each other according to their affinities and not according to their uh, location in, uh, in a particular society or community. Um, I wanna start out with first a quick overview. Everyone should have received a PowerPoint document uh, as part of this uh, presentation. And we're not intending to simply go through the PowerPoint. Uh, that's meant there as sort of a outline or guideline of the steps we're going to take today. And as a method for each of us afterwards to have an organizing document for thought and consideration and reflection. And you may find some objection or concern from your own experience with something that's in there, and that's perfect. Uh, we want people to grapple with the information, not simply accept it, uh, and to use your own insight, your intuition, your intelligence to uh, relate it to your own experience. So we're not going to go through the PowerPoint, but we're gonna follow the general guidelines of it. And we'll put some color on some of these things. So uh, the most recent age of humanity, uh, if you look at um, where things were, uh, we find the rise of mass civilizations uh, here in the United States, we have the mass media, the broadcast media, uh, that takes place all over the world. Uh, now it may be what they call privately owned or it may be government controlled depending on the country or whatever, but essentially a uniform presentation of information is put forward that people accept as their basic frame of reference for how they look at and understand the world. Uh, and the same thing happened in the educational system. You got the rise of public education that had basically a set curriculum and specific sets of information and ideas that are set forward. And in many cases, uh, this prepared the mind of humanity to interact with one another and to help us understand that it's a big world out there. There's a lot of things going on that in our villages and our small communities and towns, isolated from one another, we will never understand. So the objective age is an essential basis and foundation of where things are going. Without that, uh, we would have pure chaos if everybody was simply uh, following their own idea and just living in their own local communities. You have a very small set of ideas and conceptions that arise. So this foundational stage uh, is starting to break down as we move into a transition to the subjective age. And, and that is because eventually it became known as a place where control and manipulation could take over against the dissemination of information. So we see in the United States, we have four or five media companies that basically own all the mass media, uh, whether it's uh, local TV stations, part of a larger network or uh, radio or uh, the remaining newspapers, uh, all of these are basically owned by four or five big corporations that have their own agendas. And therefore we begin to suspect the integrity of the information we receive from what is supposed to be a broad-based platform. If we look back at 
the education we received, uh, and we we consider our own lives. Uh, if you went to a public school, whether here or in Europe or in India, wherever you might be, uh, you got a basic education, a curriculum that was standardized. And you may have enjoyed one class more than another, but uh, basically you got a framework in everything. And you got a certain amount of indoctrination with it as well. Uh, in America, there was the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and young children stood up every day and pledged allegiance to it uh, without knowing really what it meant uh, and, and what they were doing. But it was part of the criteria. In some places, it's a religious education and then the religious uh, overlay takes place even though there's a basic curriculum and that's leading a lot of people in today's world to a certain amount of skepticism about that. And that is a sign that the transition to the next phase is coming. Uh, mass media does certain things really well, however, and that is information is filtered so that in theory, you can avoid a lot of the misinformation that occurs when people are just slogging ideas back and forth at each other uh, without a lot of fact or background to it. Um, once it becomes propaganda, of course, that filter becomes uh, counterproductive. Uh, same thing with the public schools. Uh, and, and we have a good example of that. Uh, my wife and I have two children and when it was time to educate them, we decided that we wanted to uh, homeschool them, uh, but we didn't want to totally avoid the benefits of the public school system. And so we went and we said, look, if you can tell us that you're educating the children here for the future that we all see coming, as opposed to the past that's quickly disappearing, we will turn them over to you gladly and let you educate them. But if you can't give us that assurance, and I gave them some examples, I said, then uh, essentially, uh, you are not aiding children into the new coming age. You are basically trying to lock them into something that's disappearing and they're going to be uh, more or less fish out of water, as they say here. Um, and so we made them a proposal. We said, look, we'd like to homeschool them on major subjects and we'd like them to participate in your school for particular subjects where you obviously have advantages over us, science, art, music, uh, things of that sort. Uh, we'll handle the academic subjects. And so uh, I said, you'll get the benefit of seeing how they perform uh, in your school and how they interact. And we'll get the benefit of subjects being taught to learn as basics that, that we're not competent to teach. The bottom line is the school agreed. And we went through this experiment for a number of years, and they were ecstatic about it. Uh, they thought our kids did really well uh, because they were attentive, they were involved and interested in what they were there to learn, and they participated very nicely with the other people. Uh, now, fast forward this a few years, and we get to our older child wanting to go to college, and she doesn't have a high school degree. <laughs> so, um, and she chose a college. She said, I have one choice after looking at a lot of options, and it was Carleton College in uh, Northfield, Minnesota, a very academic institution, small liberal arts college. And uh, 
we went up there. I uh, first I I asked him. She doesn't have a high school degree. She's taken her SATs or her ACTs and whatever. And we can submit some of the work she did at homeschool. Uh, are you going to consider this? Or are you going to turn it down out of hand? And they said, well, we'll consider it. We went up there to interview. And when the interviewer came out afterwards, he said something to us that was really special. He said, you know, I asked her a question. And I've never, ever had the kind of answer that she gave me from any other student I've interviewed. That I said, well, what was the question? And he said it was, what is the biggest problem that you believe the United States is facing today? And her answer essentially was, I don't think about the United States. I'm looking at the whole world. Now, we didn't prep that. We knew there was no, we didn't know anything about the interview. So this is the native insight from a hybrid education between the objective mass education system and the start of a subjective education that we tried to present through our children. And I knew at that moment she'd been accepted. <laughs> that person. So we can see there are different issues coming up. People want to homeschool their kids nowadays, not to move them to the subjective age, but to hold them back from the objective ages, basic knowledge platform, and this breeds division and separation. Uh, we see a lot of that, the religious education and the political education that goes on uh, by people afraid of their children learning things that they don't necessarily themselves know or want to know. Uh, but the homeschool movement can also be uh, part of this subjective education system. So, what do we see? I mean, if we look at the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education, uh, the mother in Sri Aurobindo developed some principles of education, which included that the mind had to be consulted in its own growth, that you started at the near and went to the far, and that the children progressed with free progress, which meant that they moved at the speed and in the areas that they were ready for. Now, this is totally separate from what happens in mass education where they try to standardize everything. And if you're not ready for something, they set you back and you fail it. And then you get stigmatized and pigeonholed. Um, and if you are ready to move on faster, you get held back so that you're with the rest of the, the group for the most part. Now, over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, they started developing some advanced tracks for some people who were ready to move faster because they realized that they were just boring these people and turning them into uh, basically closed and dead minds through boredom. Uh, but that's a sign of the movement towards a subjective modification of the object of education. One of the things we look at is where are we going? What is a subjective age? What does that represent in terms of how we live and we act? If we're moving out of one age, and into another, what does the transition look like? And, and these questions are, are things that we see every day of the week, but may not recognize that that's what it is. We see all the political gridlock. We see all the arguing. We see all the conflict between liberals and progressives and conservatives and uh, reactionaries. And we wonder, well, what is this all about? Well, it's, it's the coming together of two 
different mindsets based on two different educational processes and, and media development processes, one rooted in the objective age that's leaving us and one rooting itself in the coming subjective age. And the two are never gonna agree with each other at that level. They, they rely on each other, they need each other in order to succeed, but they're not going to agree with each other when it comes to how to solve a problem and how to deal with a situation. Um, one group is going to expect that everyone does the same thing in the same way and otherwise you don't fit and you need to get out. And the other group is gonna say, well, we need to be trying new things and moving forward with our lives. Uh, behind this conflict, however, we see the rise of, a, a, I would say, a new form of communication. Um, and this is really something that we're all participating in. Uh, the rise of the internet, the ability of people all over the world to have and develop information that is available to them from any corner of the globe. And, you know, yesterday my wife was saying, well, the internet really is manipulating us because we put in a search phrase in Google and then suddenly we're getting a million ads for whatever it is we searched for. <laughs> And I said, well, no, actually, I look at it differently. I look at it that you, through your focus and attention, are creating the movement of consciousness to bring to you those things that have affinity to your focus. And I mean, I look at my Facebook feed, and it's like, Every day I get hundreds and hundreds of photos of the mother in Sri Aurobindo and pictures and memes and quotes. And I mean, it's all about Sri Aurobindo and the mother for the most part. I don't know why, but it seems like that's what the internet sends me every day. Um, I think it's because of the focus and attention. So we can turn this into a tool. We can either look at it that, oh, mass companies are now trying to control the internet and they're, they're searching and finding out what it is we're interested in and they're sending it to us. Well, they're our servants. They're doing what we want them to do. Now, the, the problem with that is if we're too narrow in our focus, we are going to get caught in a bubble. And this is what happens over on the political side very frequently where people get caught in a bubble. Uh, they only read The Guardian or uh, some other uh, liberal progressive type of uh, news and that's all they ever see. And they never see what the people who are involved with Fox News or some of the other uh, more conservative stations are putting out. And so they don't have that common mass experience anymore. It's being bifurcated into separate bubbles. And that's a danger that we need to face as we move into the subjective age. How do we not become tribal, but become universal? And how do we begin to understand the broader context and the multifarious information that is out there and the multiple different ways of approach and seeing and, and acting that are out there uh, while still having our own primary focus on whatever it is that moves us through our aspiration and through our hearts and our minds and our soul. So uh, those, are, those are issues we face. The other one is where mass media was originally able to filter and by having competitive mass media from different standpoints, they were able to more or less uh, balance each other. 
when you get into subjective media uh, and people are actually out there just choosing things themselves, a lot of misinformation shows up. And if the media isn't filtering it and fact checking it, uh, we tend to accept it if it's coming from the bubble that we're part of. And that's a danger that the subjective media has that we need to learn how to filter. Now, I was just uh, reading today, uh, preparing my blog post for the day that Sri Aurobindo was saying that uh, uh, when the psychic being comes forward, uh, it automatically is able to discern truth from falsehood and uh, real facts from fake news, if you will. Uh, and so at some point when that's fully operative within us, uh, we should be able to, I guess, uh, know and filter for ourselves what, what's real and what's not real. But we do have this danger that we're we're so isolated and insulated in these bubbles sometimes that uh, we can't filter it properly, and we can't understand what other people's experience is, and and that's part of the transitional phase that we need to work through. And that's why saying everything is subjective and there's no outer reality is is an extreme that we haven't been able to integrate within ourselves yet. And we still need that platform of the objective age and the basic education and information that comes with that as a platform against which we explore the new realms that are coming. We are not yet fully in the subjective age, it's going to take a while. We're we're in this transitional phase. It's painful. Uh, everybody's suffering with that uh, everywhere, and we get sometimes really worked up. Oh my God, how can they think that? Uh, that is so old-fashioned, and they really need to understand that there's a new world here, and that is simply an overreaction to. The transitional phase that's happening here. So where, where are we going um, and how do we get there? Uh, people are quickly, and, and Vladimir mentioned it earlier before we started today, that the COVID pandemic, uh, for all of its negatives, had a big positive in that it forced us to move towards uh, use of the tool of the internet to begin to reach out, to find new paths of information, to find new paths of communication, to find new paths of creating affinity. Uh, and we've seen that happen. I mean, we're dealing with people today all over the world from many different cultures, many different backgrounds. and they come together out of affinity, not because they were born in the same community or they follow the same religion or church. Uh, basically, it's because they find something of interest with one another. Now, you know, a lot of the internet, it could be very mundane subjects. It could be uh, how to raise succulent plants, uh, or it could be how to move towards the subjective age. Either way, uh, we're dealing with uh, the creation of worldwide affinities and tying people together in new ways that never existed before. We're living in a world that is now truly becoming one, where we have the opportunity to interact with anybody on the planet who has access to this media. And there are still a lot of people who don't. And I would say that that a lot of us get so involved in that media that we forget that there's a whole world out there that isn't involved in that yet. Uh, you know, I have a 93-year-old mother, and 
Uh, I don't know that she's ever posted anything on Facebook. Uh, and if you try to go any further than that and have her take part in a webinar or an online course or a chat session, uh, it gets difficult. She's doing a little texting now, however. So slowly kicking and screaming coming into the new age here. Um, so we're, we're, and how do we participate in this, okay? We can, we can use this to reach out and find facts. And things like Wikipedia, you know, look at the difference here. In the objective age, you had editors spending decades building an encyclopedia. Uh, like the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the standard, and it's you know it's in every library, and there's tens of thousands of scholarly written pages there, very carefully examining everything they could think of, and putting it down in print. After fact checking it, and it was the gold standard of information. I don't know anybody who looks in the Britannica today. <laughs> They go online, they look it up, they'll go to Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has had the benefit of people from many different backgrounds and perspectives actually contributing to it and self-regulating and editing and modifying and updating based on these different viewpoints, each having the ability to edit and have to document it. And over the years, it's improved dramatically. And for many things, you can actually rely on it uh, because of the way it's developed. It's a collaborative peer-to-peer -peer effort. And one of the hallmarks of the subjective age is this ability of do, doing things peer-to-peer, -peer. the ability to uh, have a relationship one-on-one -on -one and develop something unique and the ability to then join together to create something together on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It's not mass media. It's uh, any person can participate in this online media and create something and put it out there. I mean, there are people who have become uh, huge influencers on something called TikTok. And you know, it started out with all kinds of funny dance videos or whatever, and uh, now it's become the largest social media network on the planet in all likelihood. Uh, and uh, I have to say, my company just did our first sponsorship of a TikTok video on uh, natural product ingredients and what to avoid in the chemical personal care field, what, what, pro, what ingredients to avoid and their dangers. And the influencer out there has hundreds of thousands of followers and millions of likes. I mean, this is some guy who uh, started doing this and, you know, he's not with a major media corporation. He's himself and he puts it out there and he's got hundreds of thousands of people looking at this stuff. And this is the power of the subjective age and the tools that have been given to us. Uh, we can go out and find new information. We can also create new information and we can disseminate new information in ways that were never possible before. The mass media has a barrier to entry of high cost. You need big studios and equipment and you need staff and uh, basically, you know, millions, tens of millions, billions of dollars are needed to compete in the mass media field. But some guy in his basement can compete by putting something on TikTok and getting 200,000 followers and millions of likes. And, and that's an important factor that is changing the way we act in the world. Um, we've got lots of things that people are starting to share. We see uh, 
music concerts from all over the world, all different venues and uh, types of music. We see art, we see dance, we see drama, and it's now available to us through media such as YouTube, uh, where we can go out there and anything that interests us, we can see the cultural opportunities of the world. And, and those things are important to us. Uh, we can also create them. And, and that's happening right now. Uh, if we look at both locally and internationally, you've got things like Facebook and LinkedIn, and more locally, you've got Nextdoor, uh, where people in their local community can interact with each other, uh, phys who are physically close to each other. But, uh, you know, we see presentations coming live streaming out of Oroville to the United States and Europe, uh, which we couldn't imagine 20 years ago. Uh, this, is, this is all new media to us. And this is that peer-to-peer -peer energy taking up the tools that are now available and bringing us all together for experiences that we're interested in. Um, we can share our knowledge and skills. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're into uh, teaching piano or uh, growing plants or whatever it else, you can get on YouTube and create a video and People interested in that will be able to find that information and learn from you. Um, so the barrier to entry is missing here. Now we do have some risks here, and that is that people don't always have 100% accurate information. And secondly, uh, we have major media players who, from the objective age, if you will, and major oligarchs, whether they're Western oligarchs like uh, uh, some of our multi-billionaires or they're uh, European or Russian oligarchs, whatever you wanna call them, they're all the same basically. They've got billions of dollars at their disposal and they wanna tell people what to do <laughs> and they find ways to do it. And they're trying to infiltrate this uh, subjective media and bring it under their control so that's why we need a filtration process for ourselves to understand where the information is coming from, whether it's accurate, and how much we can rely on it, and whether there's an agenda behind it. So th those are all the things we need to look for. Um, people are asking, well, how do I participate? And I basically say, you know, um, you just have to start. Uh, back, oh gosh, about 13 years ago, um, I decided that I needed to change the way I study Sri Aurobindo's writings. Um, I'd been doing this since 1971, and I'd read a lot of books and, you know, was pretty facile with the information. And then I thought, you know, I really don't understand this stuff at the depth that it could be understood. So I said, what if I go back and I read a paragraph a day and reflect on it? And I thought the best way to do that is to internalize it and restate or amplify or uh, provide examples for what that paragraph was so that I can really internalize it. And so I said, okay, I'll start a blog. And the blog wasn't for anybody else. It was for me. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, I started it because I wanted to understand it. And I said, if anyone else can use it, well, they're welcome to. And I've been doing this virtually every day for 13 plus years. I've got close to 5,000 blog posts. We've been through all the major works. And lo and behold, there's like lots of people following the blog and commenting on it. And I started saying, well, okay, then I can put it out further. So I took a WordPress blog 
And you can automatically hook these things up to other social media. So they automatically happen. So it goes out to Facebook. It goes out to Twitter. It goes out to LinkedIn. And suddenly people all over the place are accessing this information. And we've got thousands and thousands of people around the world participating in this blog. Now, about a year and a half ago, I, I found out that the blog I work with has a, has a connection to a podcast network run by Spotify. And I could import those blog posts and then quickly create a podcast out of it. And so I started doing that with a daily podcast, basically reciting the blog posts. And that goes out now and this podcast network automatically puts it out there to the major podcast platforms. And it's out on Amazon uh, on my author page because I'm an author of books. So I get an author page and um, it goes out automatically out there. And the podcast is on Apple iTunes and it, it just goes out everywhere. Google podcasts, and a lot of the Spotify and things of that sort. So people think, oh, it's so complex and I don't know how to interface with all these things. Well, a lot of the tools that are out there will do it for you automatically, but you've got to start. And wherever you are, whatever it is you want to put out there, put it out there, get the platforms to disseminate it for you and see who is in the affinity, who wants to participate in what you're doing and contribute to it and, and interface and interact with you. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the barrier to entry is pretty much absent. I mean, I don't have any special uh, equipment or microphones or uh, cameras or anything else. I'm here on a laptop, sometimes I'm on a phone and get to do uh, what I love doing every day and other people enjoy it. And uh, they help educate me with their questions and their uh, uh, concerns, issues, and uh, statements that support it, their own experience, whatever it might be. And so we create together uh, an educational environment that is helping me learn about the work of Sri Aurobindo and the mother after all these years. And so I find that very refreshing and very important to me. Um, people ask me what I do here in Honolulu since I've moved away from the companies. And I say, well, I do my daily blog post and podcast. And other than that, uh, I do a few things for the companies and, um, I should mention, you know, they said I'm the author of 16 books. Actually, uh, there's two at the press right now, so it's going to be 18. But I don't author anything. Uh, what I do is I take the blog post of the day and I keep a Word file open on my desktop. Okay. And I copy that blog post. And I paste it into the Word file as the next page, put a page break on it. And when I'm done with a particular book of study, whether it's the life divine or the mother or the human cycle, whatever it might be, I go to uh, putting it onto the Word document. And when the Word document's ready, um, I realized a few years ago, I've got a publishing company. So I send it off to the publishing team, the editing team, and the graphics team. And they say, oh, another book has come in. And they digest it and turn it into a finished book. And they print it and turn it into an ebook. And so I really don't write any books. What I do is I write a blog. And the book writes itself. So uh, all of these things are connected to each other because the tools we have on the internet are amazing. And uh, it's easy to get started. Uh, you just have to be regular about it if you wanna build up any kind of a 
a group of people who are involved in that. You need that kind of a daily presence. People say, well, how do you get 50,000 people looking at your blog? And I say, well, just stay at it long enough and do things that are real and people will find it because people are searching for these things. That's one of the signs of the coming of the subjective age. So um, you've got the uh, PowerPoint, which you're welcome to go through and use as a as sort of a tool of thought more than anything else. That's why I gave it to you as a takeaway. You'll notice I didn't read from it at all today because I detest the idea of reading from a PowerPoint online. It's not the way the media is intended to be used. And um, if you didn't get it because you signed up late or something, uh, I understand it's, uh, if you put in your email address in the chat box, uh, they'll send it to you and otherwise it'll be posted on uh, La Grasse uh, Facebook page or wherever it is they post these things. I'm sure they've uh, explained that to everyone. Yeah, actually, uh, Santosh, as I uh, put in the chat box there, I'm just going to go ahead and automatically resend it to everybody that's registered uh, so they don't have to worry about putting their email uh, in the chat box, just to be sure everyone gets it. Great. And then, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, with my scattergun approach here of, of trying to add color to uh, the basic concepts, uh, I'm sure there are questions and there are comments. So. Uh, We'd like to open it up for that. And anyone uh, is welcome to uh, either put a question in the chat box or uh, let uh, someone know by raising your hand and then they'll let you in and we can talk. Oh, there are several questions. Thank you for your very inspiring and very interesting insight into many things such as copyright, this copyright oversaturated. It's actually something which is going into the past, you know, this idea of secrecy, of my privacy, all those things are kind of diluted already, watered out by the by the information you're looking for in on the net because you want to find uh, people who think the same way. So you will have to expose yourself. And uh, that is not uh, kind of uh, common for the objective age, you know? <laughs> and this clash of two different paradigms is so obvious. And I'm very glad to hear first time, actually, I found somebody like yourself, who is thinking in the same way I think, that I think the copyright is absolutely an outdated thing because every all information is available. And all information is half true. It's clear why, because we are half true. So my half truth comes to you and your half truth come <laughs> to me. This is inevitable. And so to come back to the objective kind of fundamental, you know, um, a kind of proof of uh, of the truth is actually and also a wrong movement in a way. <laughs> so we will have to go through this, as you said, transitional period, find true subjectivity. Information which is for our subjective development, not for our objective development. And this is these tools are not yet found. This kind of Google tries to build, you know, this uh, machine, the algorithm, which will help us. They found already something interesting. But to select material which will be, you know, conducive to our self-development is more difficult. It needs a deeper look into our uh, functioning as subjective beings. So thank you for these explorations, they were marvelous. In my view, they are very needed. And um, uh, actually, many people have here questions. There are five questions. You can see them here. Some of them is, is the subjective age the age of psychic being? What would you say? Uh, I would say, yes, uh, the psychic being is developing and coming forward. And uh, there is a vast energy and movement towards uh, spiritual aspiration uh, 
for many people, they feel like the objective uh, goals that have been set in front of people of career and family and success and fame and money and all those things are really lacking the essence of what we're here for. And so the subjective age is the flowering out, if you will, of the psychic being uh, and beginning to uh, direct and guide us more precisely into our spiritual development. And, and I should mention that uh, we've seen mass media go from gross external areas to more virtual areas. And eventually, we're probably going to see the development of things like with affinity groups and focus, uh, we almost might find telepathic communication to start really coming to the fore. Um, I had an interesting experiment once. Uh, my young daughter was in elementary school and had to do a science experiment. And she decided on her own that she would do one to see whether uh, telepathy was real. Okay. And she was young. I mean, maybe 10, 11 years old, something like that. And so she designed an experiment where uh, there was a screen between people and one person focused on something specific and the other person had to tell them what it was they were capturing. And various teams did better with each other than others. And actually uh, uh, the highest rated team uh, turned out to be uh, between myself and a friend of mine, Gary Miller, who is uh, a devotee who's living in Nepal right now, <laughs> uh, following his inspiration about the mystic fire and the Rig Vedic tradition. And we were very attuned and I was surprised by that. I thought I would do better with my wife or with one of my kids, but actually uh, Gary and I really had a good communication on that level. And uh, she found some interesting results. There was no way to explain it. It was, harder, it was higher percentage than random chance would have said could have occurred in her experiment. And there was no way to cheat. There was just a screen and then they were given a random thing to focus on, whether a color or a shape or whatever. And the other person uh, said what it was and then they recorded the hits and the misses. So uh, this is what children are working on nowadays. I mean, you can see the aspiration and the development of the real need to communicate on much more personal, direct, peer-to-peer -peer levels, and the development of new powers of relationship that are coming out of that. Right. The, the other example is uh, very well known already on the Facebook. If somebody got sick, for example, got cancer, he puts that I got cancer, and many people send good wishes, and you could see people say about this that it has a big influence and they are being cured just through the <laughs> internet good wishes because this is a power it's a power of subjective age which acts upon us already yeah. it's an amazing uh, kind of uh, time to be in yes <laughs> to live in to see this transition from that objective being we were before to this new being which we want to be right? And there is uh, there is more there are more questions here. Nice analysis linking the modern concepts with the technology connecting to the world. This is not a question. Amazing, so inspiring. This is another comment. <clears throat> um, uh, Santosh, I read a lot of Sri Aurobindo, but after some time it falls off me, and I am blank once again. Any suggestion on how to retain it? <laughs> I don't think you're blank. Uh, these things tend to work uh, subtly into the being, into the very texture of the way you look at the world and the way you think about things and the aspirations that you have. I don't think anything is lost 
Uh, there are times when reading is helpful to you. There may be times when it needs to be assimilated and turned into the reality within your being. And in those times, uh, it may feel blank, but it's really not blank. And so uh, no need to despair. <laughs> uh, keep doing what you're doing. Keep your aspiration alive. And uh, all things will come in their right time. Thank you. I have a, one more kind of remark, which was kind of bothering me for a while. Is this um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, when when we select a particular information from the net, it it kind of narrows down that particular type of information you were mentioning. So we receive only news we want to receive. We receive only the information we are well looking on the net. Yeah, or we had some disease or trouble. We were looking for the cure. Then immediately it sends so many suggestions. You know, <laughs> what to where to find that cure. So it is helping in a way, but it narrows down our subjectivism to become more and more subjective, as it were. We see the world through this subjective, narrow, you know, uh, keyhole. And um, um, what is happening here, I was thinking how to really change it. Do we have to change it? Because I don't want to receive, I don't have time for other information. I don't have space in my mind to really embrace all information. Yeah? And especially that which is half true because it is subjective from somebody else's point of view. So I was thinking about the design of multi-personality design. So to say uh, the design where you could be different people, different persons, as it were, uh, or even better, different um, faculties of consciousness have to be uh, addressed. So you want to develop certain way of looking at the world, different paradigms, philosophical, different psychological um, exercises can be given to you to experiment with. So to develop your capacity of the mind, flexibility, and so on. So to shift totally to a to subjective building up the personality and give the tools rather than feed with information, which is still linked to that objective industrial age where we are actually advertising and selling things because money is involved. Yeah? So in this totally pure subjective way, money will be playing a less role, smaller role than in that, you know, industrial age. So this is the, the thinking which I was, um, um, which we are struggling here in uh, La Grasse and thinking how to create this integral paradigm of knowledge, which may help everyone to select uh, the knowledge and the information from the net in a particular meaningful way for one's own su subjective self-development. What do you think about such a proposal? From well, I, um, I totally appreciate and understand the uh, sort of the bubble effect that we that I was trying to describe that you're so clearly outlining uh, that we narrow things down to specific objective facts. But the, the solution, I think, comes from how well each individual builds all the aspects of their life and their personality. Uh, I know I'm always out there searching for things like uh, what's happening in quantum mechanics and uh, what's happening mm -hmm. in uh, other paths of yoga than the mm -hmm. one I follow, uh, mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhism or uh, Patanjali's yoga. Some people complain because sometimes I'm quoting out of the Christian Bible on the Sri Aurobindo blog and I say, well, you know, if the shoe fits, I'm going to put it out there. So. All right. Uh, and, and, and I subscribe to an email newsletter called The Big Think. And this is a scientist who is exploring all kinds of things of you know the origin of the universe. And uh, today he had one on the mathematics of the Powerball lottery and why it's not a good investment. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like he's random all the way across 
a huge spectrum of human knowledge. And by broadening ourselves and by exposing ourselves to cultures, ideas, and thoughts, not necessarily polemic and political or religious dogma that, that permeates a lot of the, the objective media, but to real serious people in all different fields of endeavor, uh, we broaden our own uh, insight and our ability to relate to, appreciate, understand, accept, and support people who have different ways of looking at things, and we grow by that. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Actually, this is uh, the, the sign of a new age. If we could accept this and grow into it, widen the scope of our capacity, that would be brilliant. Uh, so there was one more question where would it disappear about uh, uh, kind of dangers of subjectivism. Shubindo addresses this in his uh, works, uh, The False and True Subjectivism. So you can find it there if you want to read there. there, there definitely there are dangers because this narrow view, fanatic view imposing on others is dangerous in a way. <laughs> Uh, and at the same time, we have to go through this. Uh, it's a transitional period as uh, Santosh presented here. Thank you, Santosh. It was a wonderful, wonderful treat. Um, much more than we could even hope for. So it was wonderful. Uh, we are very grateful to you for this. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you, you Santosh, very much. I'm going to jump on TikTok when we get out of this. <laughs> Thank, yeah, see what's happening. thank you for the invitation and, and thank everybody for participating today in this uh, experiment and the development of the subjective age. Okay. Thank uh, Santosh, you. Uh, Santosh, this is H.P. Rama. Thank you for coming on our webinar. We appreciate it. And one of these days, let's meet each other. Well, that's great. I'm in, I'm in Honolulu, Hawaii. You're always welcome to visit here. Yeah, we missed by a few weeks. Uh, we should have known I was there uh, oh. two, two years ago. So, Well, we're, we're hoping to get you here, Santosh, during the summer for our Integral Yoga retreat that's going to happen in July. So I know last year yeah. it didn't happen. And I know you've got your responsibilities there, but perhaps for a day or two, we can uh, encourage you, know, you to come out. My, my wife and I have concluded that our traveling days are over. <laughs> and we've got plenty to do to keep us busy here. And so uh, I have to say uh, the odds of us coming to your part of the world are very slim, but our door is always open if someone comes this way. Wonderful. And maybe we'll do a hybrid so that you can join us at least over the internet. That's possible. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you again. And for everybody that, that's still on, uh, we're going to continue this series. Next uh, week, we've got Matthew Andrews, and he's going to talk about bhakti in the subjective age. So please tune in. It's going to be very, very interesting. And if you've already registered for this, you do not have to register again. So perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Santosh. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste.